Reverse Ambition, a podcast that features folks who take a leap of faith to follow their dreams and passion. I have my good friend, really good friend. We've known each other for a while now. She's doing her thing out in L.A. She's currently a writer on Ava DeVanier, Queen Sugar, and a co-writer and executive producer of the upcoming 2019 feature film, Really Love. Please welcome Miss Felicia Pride. What up, girl? Hey, how are you? I'm great, great. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on here at such early, early in the morning for your time, 8 a.m. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you know, it's, it's great having you in here. So let's get it started. Um, usually what I ask, you know, just to kind of make sure the audience knew who who they're listening to is uh where you where where you grew up and where you went to school and we'll just start a conversation of your amazing journey from there yeah so um my family is from baltimore i was born in baltimore and then um moved to like uh northern new jersey <clears throat> so you can see yourself jersey or baltimore what do you represent no, Baltimore and Baltimore. That was like just a quick stint. It was interesting, too, because it was like at that time it was kind of upper middle class. My father was a really successful salesman and um, we were living a, you know, a pretty great life. Um, but then he uh, suffered professional setbacks. He was mm. actually working in corporate America as a salesman and really, really rising the ranks. And then to be hit with like some old boy shit um i hope i can cuss but uh he was fired and it was really devastating um and it he spiraled um mm. really got deep into a drug addiction so my mother moved us back me and my sister back to baltimore and that's where i like finished middle school and high school and then eventually went to college i went to a place called Towson State, which a lot of people don't know, but it's like a local community school. I always say I got an affordable education because I had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So it was affordable. And um, and at that time, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I had a professor who, Professor DeCrane, who saw stuff in my writing. I remember writing like a really angry essay about my father. And it won these awards. And she was encouraging me to minor in English. But I was like, what am I going to do with that? You know, how do I get a job as a writer? Because I didn't know any writers that seemed very foreign. So I was like, let me stick with majoring in business. That sounds like you can get a job. And that's what I did. And eventually, after I graduated, I moved back to Jersey with, like, my childhood friend and worked in corporate America. I worked in Panasonic. Um, they what had you did at Panasonic? Uh, yeah, in Secaucus, New Jersey. Uh -huh. um, and I and I was in marketing, and it was quickly evident to me that I was bored. I was bored as shit. And I started basically, like, writing bad poetry. And this was at the time, you know, the Internet wasn't huge, but I would go on to, like, deaf poetry jam forums and post my poetry. And people were This is what you were doing while you were bored in corporate America. <laughs> yeah, while I was at work, this is what I was doing. <laughs> and... <laughs> I was like, whoa, there's some power here. And then I found like this internship digging through the internet for this community newspaper out in Staten Island. And basically he would allow like young people to write. So here I had a full-time job, but I was work doing this internship for free. And I remember the first, uh, thing that was published was a review of Mary J. Blige's No More Drama um, album. That was like 2001. Mm -hmm. And I remember he would send us copies of the newspaper. And when I got a copy of that and saw my name... This was printed. Five, this is a printed five. newspaper. This is a print newspaper, yes. Okay. I, it was a wrap for me at that moment when I saw my byline. I, was, I felt very validated. I felt like people were like noticing me like my my work i mean i granted it was probably a shitty you know what i mean mm -hmm. i had no idea how to do music criticism i just like i know mary i'm gonna write this um but it was it was a it was opening for me that opportunity was huge and writing so for a community that, newspaper in staten island yeah. wow <laughs> yeah yeah called black rain news yeah oh, that's dope yeah it was a black owned community newspaper and that moment was pretty big. And you know what, through that newspaper though, I interviewed um, Suzanne Laurie Parks, who 
I interviewed her the day she did a play, right? The day she won the Pulitzer mm-hmm. for the dog. She's also now the writer of the movie Native Son that's coming out on HBO. So I got to interview folks through this small paper. It was crazy. Wow. Um, and this is like the yeah, beginning of your happened. writing career. Like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so I remember at that point going to like Barnes and Noble because I was like, I want to write a book. So I went to Barnes and Noble and like got all these books about writing books. Did you read and all those damn books? Like, I, I did. I actually did. But they weren't helpful because I, I still didn't have context for like what that meant. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So that's what made me go back to school. I um, went back to I went to grad school at, at Emerson to study writing and I studied writing literature and publishing because I was like, not only do I want to write a book, I want to publish. I want to like own a small independent publisher. Um, so I went back to school. I went to Emerson uh, for grad school. I quickly learned, though, that like I didn't want to own a small press like the publishing model was crazy to me from a business standpoint because I had a business background. I was like, this don't make sense. Right. But really leaned into my writing. It was a time for me to study craft. Um, and that was really, really exciting. But I still had this pull of like, how do you support yourself as a writer? I still need something to fall back on. Right. So right. when I graduated, I moved back to the New Jersey, New York area, moved to Brooklyn, actually. And I started working in book publishing. Okay. Um, and also simultaneously around that time to kind of feed my writing aspect, I started writing about books. I started writing about black people who worked in publishing because it was also a way for me to like network. It was also a way for me to keep my writing alive. And I sort of carved out a niche for myself talking about books from a black perspective. Right. And when I found an opportunity to because I was never good at holding down jobs. I mean I could hold down jobs. I just was never You were like bored, huh? You clearly you were bored to the nine to five model. Yeah, I would be bored. I would be like, why am I here? So like early on I left that left my um quote unquote traditional publishing career and that was like oh five, maybe like oh six I would say. Mm. And I became freelance. So I was basically writing about books. Um, I was also being a consultant for publishers and authors. Um, So I had crafted this really niche career for myself um, very early on. And then that transitioned into me writing my own books finally. Mm -hmm. Um, So I went on to write several, including like my my most known but my my baby called the message 100 life lessons from hip hop's greatest songs and that book I did a lot with in terms of traveling around the country talking about it we did a curriculum based on that book and it just was a really really great experience and then it came to a point where were you still freelancing while you was writing the book and yeah of course i was freelancing i was teaching i mean at that at that time how was was how was how was you you know the freelancing journey going for you were you bringing in enough money to to do what you need to do or was it was it hard i'm at a time i was and then things started to dry up, and I made a fatal, fatal mistake. I stopped writing. So when, like, I remember I couldn't sell my next book. Um, it was really challenging after, like, this was, like, would be, like, book seven. I couldn't sell it. I didn't know you wrote and, seven books. <laughs> what? Yeah, six, six, yeah. Um, I couldn't sell it, and I was. it was just a really awk- weird time for me. So I knew I had to get a job, which is fine because sometimes when you freelance, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Sometimes you got to go back to work. You know what I mean? But what I did was I went back to work and I stopped writing. What did you go back back to work as? Writing. Oh, right. Oh, man. I went back to work at Inroads. You know Inroads, right? Oh, yeah. What did you do for them? I was basically the D.C. I was one of the D.C. um, branch managers. It was two of us. And the D.C. office had closed at the time. So we basically reopened the office and revitalized it. And that was the other thing. Like, I I could do – I was very good at jobs, like I said. I just didn't necessarily want to do them. Mm -hmm. And we were very successful. But then I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. So during this time, you stopped writing, right? Yeah, I stopped writing. And when I left Inroads, I was like, let me try this you know, freelance thing again. And so what I did was I started to really... What, um, year, what year was this? This was probably 2008, 
Okay. Oh, so this is after the, the message. Yes. Okay. So this was actually probably like 2010. Yeah, okay. it's probably like 2010. And I was at En-ROADS for like a hot year, you know. And um, I started really expanding the work that I had been doing around um, marketing and, and consulting with books. And I started doing it with film a lot with documentaries Mm -hmm. and I started to build a fairly decent business, um, doing that work. Um, and at first it was like, you know, it was, what was that work involved? You know, what was, it was like, I would, I would be doing marketing for documentaries and for projects. Yeah. And we call it impact work. So I would basically be developing impact strategies. And and it was interesting because it was also around this time that I met Ava DuVernay. So. Oh, wow. And yeah, um, we were trying to figure out the year just recently. I want to say it was like, because the message had just came out. Basically, I met her at Black Lily. Black Lily was this um, film festival for black women, a film and arts and music festival. And I was like hawking copies of the message and she came over and she bought a copy of it. Oh, wow. But I still remember. I was like, cause she was like tall and regal and like dope. And I, I mean, like, she oh, wasn't the Ava she was back then. LA. No, this was just her. She was, she was touring with her first documentary called this is a life, which is about hip hop. Okay. Um, so she purchased my book and we kind of stayed in touch. And I remember, that she, um, and it was around this time that she was going to work on her next film called I Will Follow. Mm-hmm. So I had, I was like, whatever. I just, I was like, I needed just some sort of connection to more creativity. You know, I was doing work, but it was in service of other creators, I felt. And the fact that she was going to like make this movie, I was like, I wasn't in LA, but I was like, how can I help? And so I ended up writing the production notes. For wow. Her. And, um, and when she came to D.C., really tried to bring out folks to see that when the film came to D.C., really tried to bring out fil- folks. So that was kind of like a bug that hit me. And it was around that time that I started um, self-teaching myself screenwriting. Mm. So I was like, and also I felt because like books. How did you do that? Self-teaching. Hard for me. Because screenwriting is hard. Uh, I, trust well, me, I, I tried. <laughs> I had kind of under well, I mean, you know, I still have a grasp of story, right? It, for me, it was format, right? Mm, yeah. So teaching myself format, and but I mean, I still like my early drafts were still very shitty. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, one thing that I did have going for me, and even coming out here, that I've had going for me is voice. Like even mm. as structure, I've had voice, right. so that kind of comes through the page, which has been helpful. So it was around that time that I got the screenwriting bug, but I still felt so far away. Like, I'm in Baltimore. I was in Baltimore at the time. Um, I was like, I moving to L.A. just not, like that could, that would just seem impossible to me. It so impossible. basically you went pretty much like, quote unquote, the nine to five route, you know, doing consulting and helping this one you got exposed to the whole film industry and doing things to kind of help promote you know independent films and so forth right yeah um yeah and that's when you start getting uh the screenwriting bug i mean so when you did start writing you started writing you know that was your 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 started focus on screenwriting yeah, exactly. Okay. Because I was, books became hard for me. And I was like, but I still want to write. And I don't want to do necessarily journalism. I want to write stories. Mm-hmm. So let me give this form a chance. And it's interesting because that eventually became really love. That's what sold. Wow. <laughs> well, oh, wait a second. Wait a second. version of really love 10 years ago. Okay. That, was that the title? No, it's called Open Ended. Oh, open. I remember that. I remember that. I remember yeah. when, when you, you, uh, you did a, a, a short story. You did like a short for it. Yeah, a short film for it. Yeah. Right. So how did that came about? So you wrote the screenplay for Open Ended. Um, how did you get it made? You know, this was while you were living in D.C., by the way, right? Yeah. So I eventually like was doing going back and forth. Cause I was like, okay, Baltimore, I love home, but I need some more creative energy. So I was like, let me move to New York. But I was like, I can't do New York full time. And there was things going on like with my family and stuff. So mm-hmm. I ended up like going back and forth between DC and New York. Right. And mm-hmm. that was sort of my life for a while. And then it was around, um, 
I can tell you what I'll, I'll kind of fast forward to the move to LA because that will help. So should, uh, I don't want you to fast forward because I want people to understand <laughs> that what inspire you to you know, get you to the point where I need to move to LA. You know what I'm saying? I want, you, you're missing yeah, out. Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. That's what I'm talking about. So, you know, I had this, I had this feature that uh, I really believed in. And, um, you know, we did like a short film on it and that really breathed some creative life into me. That was around 2014. But it's still, we still saw, I still How did felt, you finance a short film? You know, how did you, you did a... Oh, uh, so it was me at me and my at the time me and um my producer Letitia Fortune we came out of pocket with that film I remember mm-hmm. using like money I'd saved for my taxes and you know we came out of pocket right. uh made it happen and that was an important milestone for me from a creative journey standpoint because it was me doing something right creative. You know, and it was like me investing in my dreams. It was me getting back into that creative space. Mm -hmm. And it felt really, really good. But I did not, I did not continue. You know what I mean? Like we did the film and I, I went back to business as usual in terms of running my consultancy. Mm -hmm. So I want to say it was probably, so that was 2014 close to the end of 2014, I actually landed one of the biggest clients I've ever had. I mean, it was a huge ass check. And mm-hmm. uh, okay, maybe that's right. Cause that was the other thing. It's like, why am doing I doing the consultant thing as well? Yeah. So I was like, all right, cool, cool, cool. Bet. And then maybe like a few months later, um, I was sat down and the project was shut down. Wow. And that was a moment for me where I was like, okay, Felicia, you got to make a decision because I was coming to the point where I was burnt out, I was tired of t- chasing checks. Mm-hmm. Either you're going to get a good government job in DC because that's what you do, right. you know, mm-hmm. or you got to go for this, this dream again. And so I sat with my mentor who was like, well, what is it that you want to do? And I was like, I want to write and create dope content. She was like, well, you should move to the biggest market. She's like, you don't have much to lose. I don't have children. I wasn't married. So she's like, you could always come back, try it. And that was the first time that I, because people had told me that I should move to LA prior, but I didn't hear them. That was the first time I was ready to receive that message. And who is this and mentor? Who is this mentor? How did you My mentor, that? she's wonderful. Her name is Alice Mayette. Mm-hmm. She's been um, just really critical in support of artists. So she used to work at the NEA. She worked at PBS for a very long time. Um, and she's just amazing and wonderful. And I remember it was like the day before Thanksgiving when we sat down and she told me this. So I go and I'm driving to my mother's house. And this is so November of 2014. So I tell my mother, I said, Mama moved to LA. And she knows how I am. I can be impulsive. Right. She's like, okay. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to move in September, basically September 2015 is what I was saying. Right. By the time things rolled around, I was like, oh, I'm going to move in May. I ended up moving, and my anniversary is coming up, March 19th of 2015. I moved that date up, up, up. I was like, What well, did I'm you do not- in preparing to move to L.A.? Um, you know, did you know um, anybody you know there? I really didn't know that many people, but it definitely humbled me because I was reaching out to folks who I was like, I only kind of knew, you know what uh-huh. I mean? Did you reach out to Ava at, at all? Um, I think I did, yeah, because yeah, cause when I first got here, she um, invited me to her birthday party, which was so wonderful. And um, so, yeah, I reached out to a bunch of people that mm. I find, you know, that I had relationships with. I also started the job search because I knew I needed a job to get to like be here for a while to get my footing. Mm-hmm. And I also still like had like two clients left over from my consultancy. So when I first, and it was interesting because I had started applying for jobs and I was getting interviews and that's when it made me be like, okay, I just need to be there to take these interviews. So I stayed with my homeboy who I knew from Maryland. He was out here for like three we crashed years. on his couch. <laughs> Yeah, I crashed on this couch. It was crazy. So I moved on a Wednesday. That Friday, I had a second interview with this company. And I basically get the job. And oh, wow. The first interview? Or second? Well, it was the yeah, f- well, it was the 
was it was like my final interview and I get the job and I'm like psyched and then that Monday they resend it because they go on a hiring freeze. They're like what? Sorry, hiring more people. <laughs> yeah. So I'm out in LA. I thought I had a job, I didn't have a job. So you know, I'm in my feelings for a day, but then I have to get that New York hustle going on. So that's what I did. I just started hustling and eventually I got another job. Um, and which was like working with these crazy artists. It was I was a quote, called a creative producer. What is that? Um, but I did that job. What's well, a creative? Exactly, it was made up. It was uh-huh. made up. Was it? Was um, it? Was it a check it though? That position. Was it a check? Uh-huh. Was it a check? Oh, it was a check, but it wasn't like what we really consider a creative producer. Basically, and I had basically made up my title too. She's like, "What do you want to be called?" I was like, "Creative producer." Like I didn't know. Right. Um, but. I was there for like a hot six months and then I got um, what I, what was my dream job actually um, was working in film distribution. So I got a job where I was director of independent film at this distribution company. And that was an awesome job because I was like traveling to film festivals, going to Sundance for free and really being of service to artists, which is something that I do enjoy doing. But of course, um, it takes you away from your own work, right? Mm-hmm. So, October, so wait a second. So, were you instead you said six months in? Were you still crashing on your homeboy's couch, or you were you know? Got oh no, I was only crashing with him for like six weeks. I eventually got my own place. First, I sublet, and then I got my own place, a place that I'm still in to the to this day. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, like LA can be difficult. You got to get your basic needs covered first, and then you kind of move on for that. So I was able to do that and I was I had this job which I really liked, but I didn't I realized that it was pushing me down the executive track. Like my next like job after that would be a VP and I had to be I started to think about like remember why I came out here. Mm-hmm. And that September of twenty sixteen um was great because I was selected for this screenwriting lab, the film independent screenwriting lab. And for my feature and that was like a So that's this little this little feature that could you it you know, you took it and you got into this screenwriting. Yeah, because uh, one of my goals one of my goals moving out here was to get the film made. Mm-hmm. And it was around that like early Probably the summer before that, I met Angel, who became the director. We met at a cookout. We both found out we were from Baltimore. She wanted to direct a romantic drama. I had a romantic drama. Mm-hmm. That's connected, and she and I started working on the script again. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of in a creative space, but I had this job. You know what I mean? And then I get into this lab, and the lab was reminded me, like, oh, shit, I love to be around other creators and writing and thinking about the work and about the craft. That was September 26th. And this is how God be looking out. October, I got um, laid off. What? Whoa. Uh, yeah. I got laid off. And so this is a job I, that you like passionately, you know, you really love. Because I, I was of, very passionate about it. I uh, loved it, but it also was not why I moved to LA. So right. I had to like really get, cause I'm, I work well when I'm backed into a corner. Mm-hmm. So I had to be backed into the corner so I can come out swinging. So that was when I was like, okay, Felicia. And I was also starting to realize that film is a director's medium mm-hmm. and not a writer's medium. And I also realized that I only had one project that was sellable. You know, right. I was like, I need sure, to that's sometimes that's all you need. Up. Right. Well, right. Yeah, but I also need, I'm a writer. I need to get my portfolio up, right? Okay. So I basically, for that next sort of year going into 2017, I really spent 2017 getting back to the work. So I started to take a bunch of TV writing classes because I was like, okay, I want to move into TV. I want to still be able to do features, but in terms of being a working writer, TV is is a is a writer's medium. Mm-hmm. So I started taking a bunch of classes. I got a career coach who focused primarily on entertainment. Um, so she helped me to kind of come up with a game plan and how to position myself. I joined a writer's group who still like my writer died to this day. Um, and we not only, you know, read each other's work and that sort of thing, but it's also like accountability. It's about um, rising together because they all are hella hustler, hella ambitious, hella talented. Um, so I really just dived into work. And so to support myself, I started taking these odd jobs that were very sort of 
behind the scenes, right? Because I also realized that I had to shift the public face of me back to writer because people mm. forgot I was a writer. <laughs> they did. And even out here in a short period of time, they started to think of me as an exec. So I was like, okay, I have to shift the narrative publicly. So everything I want to do publicly, I wanted to be writer. But behind the scenes, I was doing all these odd jobs, man. I was like, for instance, I, this woman I used to hire when I was working at, as a dish, as director of independent film, she's like an outreach producer. So she does impact work, what I used to do. So she was running this big campaign. I was like, yo, I'll be your coordinator. She's like, are you for real? I was like, yeah, I don't want to run a campaign. Just tell me what to do and I'll collect the check. Right. And that's exactly what I did. I was her coordinator, basically an assistant helping her, uh-huh. but no one knew about it. You know, no one had to know. And then I was a virtual executive assistant for the nonprofit who had that big contract that they gave me. Right. That it had to be the project shut down. I was an executive assistant for one of the, um, their founders. I was horrible at it, but it was a great check, and it allowed me to work because it was virtual. It allowed me to write. Right. So I started all these positions where I could prioritize the writing, and then I started to make psychological shifts because my relationship with the work had gotten kind of fucked up. Like why? I had- why? I, because I, I put too much pressure on the work to financially sustain me. Mm. I put too much pressure on my writing to financially sustain me. I was writing to make, you know, and you're writing for a check. Right. <laughs> and yeah, you were, you weren't writing because you love writing. You were like, oh, I need to get this exactly. check. Let me just write and, some bullshit. And, <laughs> exactly. And when you don't write, because at least for me, when you are able to write without the need to be paid for it mm-hmm. you're able to write kind of freely that's not to say that i don't want to be a full-time writer my goal was to become a full-time writer again right which means that writing would be my my sustenance but i can't put that on writing i the writing is not responsible for me financially i'm responsible for me financially mm. and it may not sound like a difference to people but it was a shift for me psychologically right and i just also had to put the work first i had to realize that the work is the most important thing I had work to realize being writing yes for mm. me writing whatever however ever you know other people define it for me the work means writing right mm-hmm. and for me everything springs from the work right mm-hmm. joy creativity, freedom, all that springs from the work. And so I had to really, really get back to um, the work. And I had to remove a lot of that fear of like that the work can't support me. And I, mm. and that was because I had put so much onus on it financially supporting. But no, the work supports me in ways way beyond financial, way beyond financial. And once I was able to make those sort of shifts, things started opening up for me. I... The first big thing that also happened after the screenwriting lab, I was selected by NBC's Writers on the Verge. And out here, um, these fellowships that a lot of the networks run are kind of a big deal because they- How did you get uh, selected for the Writers on the Verge? Um, Did you submit the um, same- same... Yeah, I I wrote some kick-ass work. Well, it's like basically you have to write- um, uh, a, spy, a script based on an existing show. So I wrote a spec for Atlanta mm-hmm. that was really wild and crazy and dope. And then you submit original pilot. So I was able to be selected because of my work, and that's what felt good too. I'm like, okay, this is validation for my for my TV work, you mm-hmm. know. And that program was wonderful because again, it put me in a creative space with really hella talented writers. It also brought me into the NBC Universal family and the diversity family. The the program is run by this wonderful woman, Karen Horn. Um, And so it expanded my network exponentially. So it was a great program. um, And it really helped me in terms of when I was ready for staffing. Okay. Okay. So you got into this program and, you know, you was doing odd jobs to kind of make sure your bills were paid, but you weren't putting pressure on the work, which is the writing. So after yeah. the program. And but then what happened, though, during the program, my father died. Wow. The, yeah. Wow. So, how did how did that impact you psychologically and, you know, you know, physically? And did you have to go back and did, did it interrupt your movement or? You know. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of things that happened. Number one, my father was my 
well, he and I had a strained relationship for part for part of my for part partial time. Mm-hmm. But we were able to to reconcile, which was my greatest gift, one of my greatest gifts. Because my father was my biggest cheerleader. He was um, always an entrepreneur for the most part after his corporate career. He always pushed, understood my weirdness, understood mm-hmm. that. He would always tell me, Felicia. Were you like your father in, in a lot of ways? Yeah, I was just like him in many ways. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like I got a lot of his, you know, even his troubles with being an employee after his, what happened in corporate America. Like I got all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but he would always say that, you know, you frustrate yourself when you try to normalize yourself. Mm, and that's a good quote. Always, you frustrate yourself yeah. when you try to normalize yourself. That's dope. <laughs> yeah. And then he would tell me, like, you're an eagle. Why are you trying to fly with chickens? You know? <laughs> and, right. <laughs> but he was, um, and now also, he also was really into, like, personal development. Mm-hmm. And then, so when he was sick during the, the first lab I did during the screenwriting lab. Mm-hmm. And then he passed during the NBC lab and yeah, I had to go back. And also earlier when, when he got sick the first time I realized, and then just being out here in, uh, in Hollywood, I realized that I had to get my self care tools up. Mm-hmm. Like the business is nutty as fuck. Like it's nutty. Mm-hmm. And I realized like, okay, this business is not going to make me crazy. I need to make sure I have my tools in place for when things happen because I need to be able to deal with them. So it was around that time that I started really getting into therapy and yoga and hot yoga and meditation and hiking and all of these things to keep me grounded. So when he passed, it really also reminded me of keeping my self care up Mm -hmm. and allowing myself to grieve. Um, But he would always tell me he he doesn't, he didn't worry about me. He's like, I don't worry about you, Felicia. I don't worry about you. So I, at least I had that, like, I, it wasn't one of those things like, oh my gosh, I wish my dad could see this. Like, partly feel that way, but he already knew I was going to do what I was going to right. do. Right. You knew he you were going to be good. He had that much confidence in you and your Yeah, ability. like, he already knew. So it wasn't like I had to, like, prove anything to him and, mm-hmm. like, it was too late and, you know, so, but it did take me out for a bit. I didn't know if I'd be able to finish the program um, I remember the script I was writing in there, I was struggling, but they were so wonderful and patient, my cohort and Karen and the team. And so when I had my table read, it was a big moment for me because I was like, I got through this. I finished this. Um, so yeah, that was, that was, it was a lot. Mm. <laughs> it was so, a lot. So you finished. A lot going on at the end of 2017 that made me really be like 2018, you know, I need to, it's about self-work and it's about craft work and like combining those two. Mm -hmm. All right. So you went through hell (laughs) in 2018, (laughs) but you got refocused back on the work. I mean, 2017, so you got refocused back on the work. So what did 2018 have to offer you after you go through? Oh man, 2018 came in, you know, I officially sold the feature in 2018. And okay, then I, so it, how did that happen? Yeah. Like, walk me through that <laughs> process. Because last you talked um, about it, you, you know, you met the director and y'all started working on it. So how did it go from there to like, okay, I officially sold the feature? <laughs> yeah, so she and I um, basically started to really think about who this would be a good fit for. And we always, Macro was always on our list. Um, and we were also able to, around that time, um, attach another producer, Mel Jones, who's a, just a force. She, um, you know, worked on Dear White People and Burning Sands and like, she's just a force as a independent film producer. So she also brought some cachet to our project Mm -hmm. and, but like macro was very organic in terms of, um, Aaliyah Williams who works there. Uh, Mel had a project there and Aaliyah, Angel told Aaliyah about our project and Aaliyah made it happen in terms of getting us a meeting in there with the whole team. Wow. Not with just Charles, the whole team. It was like 10 people around the table and like interns were around the table. Wow. Angel. Yeah. So Angel and I went into pitch and, um, 
that they loved our pitch and had notes on the script. So we went back and made changes on the script and came back in. The second time we came back in, it was the three of us, me, Mel, and and Angel. And they were like, let's do this. And then that started a lot of balls rolling and and, um, officially selling it. And then we shot it in summer of 2018. Oh, wow. So it's done already. Project yeah, it's in post-production. Oh, wow. Damn, that happens yeah. that happens so freaking quickly, though. And I mean, not really quickly no, because well, no, you started years, this but. journey. <laughs> yeah. So, but once, yeah. once it seemed like once you uh, shifted everything back to the work and making that priority and not using it as a way to make a living, that's when everything, all the doors started opening up, right? Absolutely. And I've learned a lot of lessons on, along the way. We were kind of talking about this earlier, but I realized that my focus is on the work and then staying in alignment. Mm. What um, does it mean by staying in alignment? Because yeah. the problem was, is that I used, I'm a hard worker, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? But um, success doesn't necessarily come just from hard work because mm. I just, all probably know people who work their ass off but are still like in that perpetual grind Mm. and what i found out for me particularly like running my consultancy yeah i was working hard but i was also reveling in fear and self-doubt and i was misaligned so coming out here what i realized is like yeah it's about the work but I also have to stay in alignment. I have to keep my vibration high. I have to detach from outcomes and like be able to trust, trust God's plan. Mm, wow. Because so, also when I try to when I try to put my own outcomes on stuff, they're usually so much smaller than what God has in store. So mm-hmm. I have to let that go. You know, so it's a lot also about learning how to surrender and when to surrender. Um, and so that's why I'm like, it's not just about the work, because we can work hard, work hard, work hard. But if we are stuck in fear and a whole bunch of other conditioning, we're blocked. Mm, blocked. Right. So right. I had to do a lot of unblocking. I'm still doing a lot of unblocking. How do you fear um, is a very a big... powerful thing, though. How are you able to, like, let go of fear and just put your trust in the universe, God, and and, and your work, you know? How are yeah, you... I mean, I think there's – but the thing is, it's like I have so much evidence of the fact that he is always looking out for me. Right. <laughs> And so I have to just continue to trust in that. And also recognizing that even some, like some fucked up shit, I told you the business is nutty, right? So I mm-hmm. saw early on, I was like, oh, this is crazy. But I'm also starting What's to What's an example that? of the business being nutty? You know, we know how it is crazy. We always hear it's nutty, but what does that mean? You know? Oh, man. I mean, <clears throat> broadly speaking, it means that um, like, I mean, you can't, you can't necessarily trust everyone, mm. but I mean, not everyone has your best interest in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. it is a business and it's a very, um, cutthroat. Yeah. It's very cutthroat. It's a business that makes a lot of money. Um, and so there's like, there's small slights that almost happen on a daily basis. And then there's big slights that make you question your talent, your value, your contribution, all of these things. Um, but what I realize is that I, when I have the perspective that things happen for me and not to me, mm. and I'm actually starting to see evidence of that, like things where I was like trying to control the outcome so much and then it happened and it didn't happen the way that I wanted to. Now I'm seeing the evidence. I'm like, oh, that actually was in my best interest. Right. God is looking out. And so the trust is really, really important. And also it just helps with your sanity. Like mm-hmm. just letting go, like trying to control everything that you, things that you can't control and you're trying to control them also takes away from, in my opinion, the the energy that you could be putting into your work. Right. Oh man, you dropping some gems, girl. Like, you know, <laughs> I can't wait to, you know, listen to this over again because you're really, you know, speaking some church right now. <laughs> Oh, yeah, not? well, that's, 
I mean, it took it t- it took a lot to get to this place, um, and so that's why, like for me, the excitement is like twofold, and the urgency is twofold. It's like the excitement and the urgency of mastering self, mm. and the excitement and the ex- urgency of mastering craft, right. and those are lifelong journeys, you know, and those are the most important journeys. And I'm excited of like what comes from that, right. you know, and I expect great things. I just don't attach. I try not to. Let's say that it can be difficult, but I just try not to attach to how that looks. Right. So really love is done, made in post-production. When is going to be released? Um, we'll see. You know, that's all about distribution is a beast as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's the next phase of thinking about that. Listen, um, and my... then what will happen? Huh? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, what else will happen in early 2018 is I sold a television show. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, okay, okay, I didn't know about yeah, that. Yeah, it hasn't been announced yet. Yeah, it hasn't been announced. Because, you know, so many there's so many steps to get something on air. So a right. lot of times we sell stuff as writers, but it doesn't mean it'll reach the air. But it still was a huge accomplishment given. Um, but what's crazy is it was a book that I've loved for years. I had actually, I won't name it, but I actually had reached out to the author like, the year prior and was like, I love this book. I would love to do something with it. She's like, Oh, it's already represented. Um, and then when I went on a meeting and mentioned this book and basically that's what worked out for me to get into the room in order to pitch on it and then was able to sell um, the show. So I've been working on that. Um, and then the being a, then getting staffed on, um, Queen Sugar. So within a year, I sold a film, sold a television show, and got staffed. Wow. So how did you uh, get on staff as Queen? You know, Queen Sugar as a as a writer. You know, just yeah. by you and Ava going way back. <laughs> no, no. I mean, that's the thing. Like, um, you know, you have to continue to prove yourself. You know, mm-hmm. and I wanted to make sure that it was also on the merit of my work. So. It was basically through the same process of my reps um, submitting my material and um, the showrunner reading and liking and not knowing that I knew Ava or anything like that. Wow. Um, and I, yeah, he and I vibing and, um, yeah. Damn, girl. And not even knowing that, like, you know, Really Love was part of it, like, that I worked with, um, that Kofi was in, um this so that they didn't know that you had done really love as a writer no i I think the biggest thing for me out of the getting staffed or getting to staff was i had an experience of getting an offer on a show and the offer and then it didn't work out Mm. and i was really upset about that and so what i did was i fueled that into writing a new sample Mm. a new hour-long sample in like two weeks, I was writing furiously this hour-long sample. And that was the hour-long sample that the showrunner read and liked and called me in for Clean Sugar. So that's why I'm like, it always goes back to the work. When you're frustrated, go back to the work. When you're happy, go back to the work. When right. you feel down and out and you feel overlooked, go back to the work. And the work will always be what opens the doors. Wow. It will always work. I was going to ask you... Uh... Well, I am asking you, what advice would you give any up and coming aspirational, you know, hustler, TV writer, all those things that you are right now? What was one of the biggest advice that you would give someone, you know, who wants to be where you are right now? And because you're bubbling, babe, you like the world's about a not the world's about a no Felicia pride, you know, like, you, you know, within a year. You really love, you sold a television show, you were a staff writer on one of the popular, most popular shows on TV, Queen Sugar. Like, how can you not be the... Thing. Huh? I want to mention that it's a blessing. Like, you know, Ava has created an environment and an opportunity for, you know, creators of color and, and women creators to get opportunities. It's hard to get into a room, you know, mm-hmm. and then also have a wonderful showrunner like Anthony Sparks, who saw something in my writing and then who's like a, such a giving teacher. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's amazing. It's a blessing. I feel so blessed and I'm so grateful. Um, 
and the other thing is like you know i'm also not young right i turned 40 this year i moved to la Girl, you I was... still look young though <laughs> like don't crack baby I moved... <laughs> <laughs> I moved to la when i was 35 you know everyone in my writers group is younger than me um la can give you the sense of that you have to be young but what i found is like age for me at least in the life experience has been um of a virtue a value that i've used um in order to be a better artist but also to maneuver faster you know what right. i mean I think age helps work smarter not faster. harder work smarter and harder yeah, i guess four years it'll be four years um but you've done a lot in here. four years and you know that's a, a big wave of folks who are moving to la because mm-hmm. i guess that's the thing now but what I notice about you, you're like, you went to L.A. And you were like, you weren't about the scene. You was about putting in that work, you know, no matter what, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I think it was because, number one, I had not been. I, I know what it is not to write. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I stopped writing for seven years. So when I was able to get back to writing, I'm like, I'm never turning away. I'm never turning my back on writing. That doesn't mean I may never have to get a job again. I don't know, but I'm never turning my back on writing. Right. Right. And also I had a very compelling reason to come out here. I think I see people who, you know, struggle with LA is because they don't have a really clear, compelling reason why they're out here because you have to return to that reason when shit gets hard. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Out here because I have stories that need to be told. Right. Period. And when people are closing the door in your face and acting like they don't know you and all these things, oh, that's right. Because I have stories that are bigger than all of us that need to be told. Question. You know, like you have to have a vision that's bigger than all of the bullshit. Right. And you have to hold on to that vision. Where you get all these stories from, by the way? You know, I know you're, you know, 40, but damn, you know. <laughs> How the <laughs> hell you, you know. I've had a crazy life, though. So we were kind of talking about, you know, uh, me being on Puff's communication team, which was so random. What? 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 You went who? Puff? Puff Daddy? Yeah. <laughs> yes. When? When did this happen? Like this was last year. So yeah. So um, <laughs> it's all random, but yeah, I was uh, recommended to be a writer on Puff's communications team. So I was able to work with him on um, stuff that he was doing as well as work on season one and season two of the four, mm-hmm. uh, the, the music show that he was on. And the one thing that I was so amazed by, like being around him is he really believes he can do anything. Wow. While also knowing his limitations, which is a hard balance to strike. But his confidence is, I've never met someone with so much confidence before in my life. Wow, really? Like, God, I was like, God, why am I here? (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? And I think it was that, the confidence. Puff rubbed off on you? Um, Yeah, because you can't, because I remember one time he's like, you can't not, you can't be around him and, you know, have your head down. Like, that ain't going to work. You know what I mean? Like, so I really feel like the confidence piece was was big for me to see that and to be around that. All right. So now your vibration is on, on on the next level and your vibes and your, you know, you're aligned so well. So sky's the limit for you right now, huh? Well, sky's the limit for any of us. We just have to believe that and tap into it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, that's the thing. All right. So uh, back to my question, I was like, what was that advice that you want to give anyone? Oh, yeah. Anyone who what is mm-hmm. trying to write? Or... It was just basically trying to find themselves, find their voice, find your purpose, find your passion, you know, and, and not only find it, but actually live it, you know? Mm-hmm. What advice would you give? You know, folks, I mean, you did give a lot of advice in terms of making sure you focus on the work, uh, make sure your vibration is on point. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you're grounded. I think I got that from the conversation as well. You know, anything else? Yeah, I think one of the big things is it's funny because I haven't done a lot of things in my career. Right. Um, And at a certain point, it was like people couldn't even describe I couldn't even describe all the stuff that I've done but what I realized is that a lot of it was me running away mm. it was 
running away from my actual purpose. Um, and it was me just living in fear. And so I think one of the biggest things, like almost every sort of block can be brought back to fear. And I think what's important is to be able to recognize how fear is blocking us in so many different ways. Mm. And then to be able to develop strategies in order to move through that fear. The fear is not going to go away, but we can't, it's just so, too often we let it run our lives. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think that's one of the big things is like working on removing those, those blocks of fear that are preventing us from our purpose. Like my therapist tells me, um, she told me not too long ago, like when I'm hiding, I'm denying the world my brilliance. Ooh. And I feel like a lot of us. Damn, that's another gem you just hiding. dropped. <laughs> yeah. I feel like a lot of us are hiding, whether it's our talent, our purpose, our visions, we're hiding. And because of that, it's almost like a selfish act, right? It's because of that, because we want to be safe. Mm. Um, we're denying the world our brilliance. Mm. And that's one thing that I'm continuously working on is being able to share. Right. <laughs> and it's even uncomfortable to say, like, share with the world my brilliance. But, yeah, that's what it is. Share, share your greatness. And I don't mean brilliance just in terms of intellect. Yeah, I don't mean brilliance just in terms of intellect, but I mean brilliance in terms of the, the light that we emit, mm. right? The brilliant light that we emit. So that's what I would say. I mean, I don't know if that's advice, but that's one thing that I've been I mean, that's so freaking deep, yo. I mean, I almost dropped mic <laughs> when you just dropped that quote. I mean, it's and it resonates, you know, I could relate to that because I feel like um, I know I, you know, a lot of things that I do um and frustrations i have it comes back down to me being afraid of success you know mm, um, that's mm -hmm. a big a fear lot of have that. Yeah. you know me being afraid yeah. of success like all the things that comes with that you know the hateration the, the mm -hmm. responsibility the mm -hmm. burden you know mm -hmm. it's not a fair afraid of failure it's really afraid of success and i feel mm -hmm. like that that line kind of like hits hits home when it you know when it comes to me personally in my journey as an entrepreneur and me, tr you know, someone as a creative trying to get my brilliance out there to the world. So, I mean, I feel like I'm talking to kindred spirits right now, you know, and you know, I definitely was yeah. taking notes and I am definitely going to re-listen re to this this uh, conversation because I feel like it was a great one. Me too. So I can remind myself. <laughs> Hell yeah, girl. I mean, y'all yeah. listen, listen. It's a lot of conditioning that we have that it take, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And, you know, just to be a black woman, you know, out in Hollywood killing it, you know, really shows that you are, you know, where you're supposed to be and you're living your truth. So congratulations on your, 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 Thank you. your past success. Congratulations on your future success and continue killing it, girl. I'm so, so happy and proud of you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, I mean, we go way back. So it's so, you know, I love seeing people's journeys, you know what I mean? And um, yeah. so, yeah, keep, keep doing the damn thing. Well, yeah, man, girl, I'm, I'm just hanging out to your coattail, girl. And thank you so much <laughs> for being on Reverse Ambition. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, sweetie. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you all for tuning into Reverse Ambition Podcast. It is really a pleasure sharing these amazing journeys with you. It may take some time for you to find your purpose and realize your dreams or for your purpose and dreams to find you. When it happens, don't be afraid to pursue them. Be more afraid if you don't. Trust God. Trust your journey. And most important, trust yourself and it will all work out. Until next time, I am Kelsa Cooper, The Social Broker. Thanks again for listening.